I'm looking forward to a few tips on this. I'm going to need them, I think, in the very near future. Harmonising this sort of thing. And uh, so I'll leave you with our good friend, Dr. Jan Mercer. <laughs> One more clip and probably I collapse, you know, it's one, two, three, it's just too many pins. Anyway, I'm, I'm here again and I'm very happy to see you. It's few of us today, but um, that doesn't mean very much as far as uh, my presentation goes. I always try to figure out what to say anyway, whether you are one or twenty here or thirty or forty. But I really appreciate you coming. Uh, you are very important to, to me because um, I like to share certain things with people who really are seekers, people who want to use their minds, you know, to, to, to control their lives rather than be controlled and let other minds to do the thinking for them. We live in a very, very difficult times. The times which try to streamline everything, to put everything to the same level. There is nobody who be down or up, everybody would be the same, totally like a machines, you know, interchangeable without any personalities. We live in a very difficult times because there is so much confusion these days. And so much lying. We live in a time of a big lie. Now we had an age of reason and now we have an age of, of big lie, you know. Whatever you hear from media, you have to be very, very careful because most of these reporters these days are nothing less, nothing more than stenographers just telling what they've been told to say. And so it's very difficult in such a turbulent times at every level, political, economical, religious. It's a very difficult time to maintain harmony within yourself. Naturally, if we accept ourselves purely as a body and nothing more, then the issue of harmony between mind and spirit is purely hypothetical because we do not recognize these terms and therefore we would never look for that harmony except in some <coughs> imaginative sense. But um, there is a certain tendency now to speak about more than just a body and the term spiritual inner is become more frequent even in some of the echelon science. I just got a book which is called Biological Transcendence, you know, which if nothing else tries to explain our higher selves still from sort of biological point of view, but at least there is an attempt to explain something internal as an evolutionary process which continues as opposed to physiology which tends to be as it is for a very very long time and doesn't seem to be evolving so our physical evolution pretty well is is done what we are that we are but uh, spiritually we still trying to open some faculties within us which would allow us to see things differently. And it is our perception, how we see around ourselves, which determines how the world we live in actually looks. Um, it's very hard to accept that we are really just a of water and a pile of salt. It's very hard 
to think in a terms that brain extract thoughts the same way as liver extract the bile. You know, we we are more, and that's what I want to talk today a little bit about. What is that more, and how we can reach understanding of these different levels we occupy at the same time, and how we can adjust different parts so everything is in is synchronized and it's it's in a harmony. We have to always keep in mind that um, we either are affected or we affect. And when we affect, we are the masters, we are the ones who are in control. And if we are affected, then obviously we then are not the masters, nor we are in control. When we look in sections, we look on our body first. This is what most people consider beginning and all of everything. So we are very preoccupied with this body. The body gets ill. We are looking for a way to cure the body because we somehow feel we are curing ourselves. But in a sense, it is just the body. I have stressed quite a few times here that we are living spirits who have bodies. These bodies are vital for us to experience this world around us in a physical sense, in a physical frequency. But when that experience goes through our eyes and goes through our ears and through our touch, through our senses, then it becomes non-material. It's being converted into a, an awareness, into an experience. It's being sort of a building stone of our own self, our own personalities. So when, as I've said many times, I look, I see. It's not my eyes which sees. Eyes is just the lens. And the light goes through it and then reflects and is being converted into a little current and it goes to the brain and supposedly in a brain somewhere is being converted into a vision, awareness, whatever. But even brain does not, in my mind, do this awareness. It's purely a, a mechanism. It's like a radio which picks the frequency, you know, when you tune into that frequency and then sort of amplifies that frequency in a certain coherent matter and, and you get a sound, but uh, it's not in a radio. Radio just picks it up. And we are in a frequency of living, very similar to the frequency of sound. And we are attuned through our body mechanism and then we reflect certain awareness, certain personality. Now, body even if it is sort of independent from our spiritual self, is interconnected through a medium. Some media, people call it etheric body, some finer body which basically acts as a matrix to which the matter pours and then shape itself in a form we are now. But I've been thinking about it quite a bit and I said, this etheric body, what sort of uh, substance it is? What is a mind? You know, when we speak, you know, like I'm a psychologist by training, and the mind is purely a folksy way of saying a brain. Because in a modern understanding of body, the brain causes all our feeling, our perceptions, our thoughts. And this is byproduct of certain biochemical reactions which are going on in our brain, different part of brain. And somehow then, you know, they are synchronized, you know, and we get awareness, you know. Well, I don't think matter is capable 
of thought. This is a very contrary view of, for example, Marxism or materialism for that case, which believes that matter is actually capable of thinking at the highest level of its evolution. Well, matter can evolve, that's very true, the same way as um, bubbles can increase, you know, when you pump air into them, so bubbles or things can grow as a result of chemical reaction. But <coughs> thought, to me, is not function of physical. Doesn't matter how refined that physical might be. I feel that um, behind matter there is always that which is immortal, that which is eternal, and therefore it cannot have any essence of physical, because anything which is physical is subject to decay. It doesn't matter how long it takes, it has to disintegrate. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, whatever, whether it's an atomic level, molecular level, or any other level, it would happen. When I say eternal, when I say immortal, I'm talking on something which is totally immune to all this decay. And therefore, it must be undefined by any material understanding. It could affect matter, because uh, this is the actual reality. And that reality is a pure, pure intelligent, pure, um, pure quality in any way you look on it. But as it embodies matter and tries to shape that matter to its own image, obviously there are some losses and imperfections inherent. And it's like carbon copy. If you do too many copies from the semester, you know, you get a certain decay as time goes. So there is a certain amount of decline. And I feel somehow that uh, matrix which shapes the physical is being used too many times over and over again. And so the quality of the matter which sort of is trying to reform itself to a, a body, or whatever it is, whether it's a body of a human or animal or, or a tree or any organic thing, you know, it tends to wear down too. And maybe that uh, the degree of illness or imperfection reflected on bodies in general, that mean people being born, is more noticeable these days perhaps than it was even in the past. And it might not necessarily be that um, it's because of food and things, because when the baby is born, baby had not yet time to contaminate itself that much by all what it can contaminate, contaminate itself when it gets uh, older. But in spite of it, a lot of babies these days are born with some problems. I know I spoke to quite a few people from certain countries where mothers don't, as I was told, rule number one, have the child as quickly as you can while you still have strong body, so don't wait. Second, don't care whether it's boy or girl, just make sure it's healthy. So people, you know, worry more these days, and you can see there is increase in um, infertility, all kind of things. My feeling is the metric which forms these physical aspects is being damaged. And that damage is not necessary yet so significant that uh, it cannot produce forms, but there is significant decline in some ways in the quality of many of these forms, and you can only compensate for it to a certain point by being young, being selective, and all. But overall, uh, tendencies of these new forms, newborn, to deteriorate is noticeable. We have a rampant cases of different uh, chronic illnesses. In spite of all the medicine and money we have to throw on it, people are not as healthy as they used to be in general. I hear around me people complaining in the Center about certain 
pain and aches and things, which in the past people never went to doctor and they survived, they lived to a reasonably high age. It's a misnomer to say that uh, people are living younger these days, sorry, longer these days than in the past. This is not true at all. I just looked through some books on statistics, on longevity, and really, even in the old Greece and, you know, old Rome and thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago, people lived the same long age, reached the same long age as we do today. There were some ten years to people died in the 70s, 80s. Obviously, there was high mortality because of wars and hardships of living, you know, but when people live, they live pretty well. There is no significant increase. On average, it might be, but individuals have lived as long as they are living today, you know, so it's not that we have somehow shifted age curve in such a way that people couldn't live that age, to that age, they could. And so I would say that in many ways, uh, when we look on what's happening today, we can say that our bodies are in jeopardy. They are in jeopardy because of things we do not really understand. And we try to interfere with nature uh, by trying to force our bodies to behave in certain ways, to be healed in certain ways. We are putting into our bodies substances which were not in existence when our bodies initially started to be formed and spirit entered into them. We are not only putting wrong things into them, but our understanding of what body is and how it functions is itself just an opinion. We are not really, as we say, so solid in our understanding that we would claim that what we say is true. We just have a certain notions. Today they might be valid and 100 years from now we will be laughing. We will be horrified how we treat it or how we are treating our bodies. As we look back, we see the same way. So that curve is just shifting. There is never sort of a, a level of diminishing ignorance. I think our ignorance is as, as, as big as ever been. And since we lost this healthy instinct, what is right and wrong, we are doing more wrongs than we ever did in the past. There is... <coughs> intelligent machine, our body is very intelligent machine, designed to repair itself and to maintain itself in optimum condition without the assistance of so-called medical establishment. After all, it's a new term. Medical establishment is 20th century thing. In the past, barbers were doctors. You get a haircut and you get an amputation at the same time. You know, it made very little difference. It's only when they managed to organize themselves into a sort of a coherent body that they started to dump on all these other competitors, uh, alternative therapies, we call them today, but not long ago that was the major, major therapy. The so-called medic medicine, the drug business and all, that's a new, new concept. And unfortunately, effect of all this on us is not yet necessarily as self-evident as it would be in the future because our initial build and resistance against decay and against malfunctioning is, is breaking down. It's like the car, you know, which sort of has a certain warranty and after that it tends to go into pieces. Our body has certain warranties. As long as you maintain them, properly, but uh, we have lots of mileage on our bodies, which have been repeatedly punched, you know, from the same metric, so we are always carrying extra variable, which might sort of shake our health, and at the same time, with too many, as we say, cook, too many cooks spoil the soup or whatever broth, the same is with body, too many experts, you know, will eventually destroy the body because there are different opinions. Everybody believes his way of approach. But uh, 
in some ways, we are on the receiving end of it. So we would go from one doctor to the other doctor specialist, and everybody tries something else. Like there is a saying that, you know, if you get two astrologists to read your horoscope, you get two different interpretations. Well, I would say that if you go sometimes to two different doctors, you will get two different findings. The point is that um, what I'm trying to say, we have abdicated our personal responsibility for our body. We've been encouraged to do so by the system. Go and see the doctor, make sure that at least once a year you get a checkup, and it goes on and on and on, early detection, assure long life and whatever. All kind of slogans been created, and we've been conditioned in childhood to see the doctor. And we listen to these guys whose average age to die is about 58, you know, how we should be healthy and how we should live long. Well, you get people who are living 100 years and more, and we do not listen to them, how they achieve that, because they don't have this education. So sometimes, you know, I want to say education is not necessarily the best way to deal with the problem, and you should run sometimes from the so-called educated people, because education doesn't guarantee intelligence, you know. Intelligence, as I've said, is something which is inborn, and you cannot add into it or subtract from it. Intellect is a byproduct of this intelligence. Intellect itself can be very bold using acquired knowledge to make decisions and take actions. But intelligence itself, if it's missing uh, to a certain extent, cannot tamper down, to turn down this intellect. Intelligence usually manifests itself with age. We start to mature and we start to understand and, and that sureness, that boldness we used to have because of our intellect, it tends to waver because we realize there is more into it. But unfortunately, those who run the world are usually the one which displays very much of intellect, but very little sometimes of intelligence. And when you get older, then you become more aware of life, your intelligence shines through, your intellect tends to sort of diminish because you realize that sometimes it's better not to do anything in order for things to happen than to do. So we have so, so many illnesses now. All what we're looking is for a new illness. It's one of these quests. You might get a Nobel Prize if you discover some new illness, and that illness simply is all what you are after. Symptoms. Describe the symptoms. But we do not understand the cause. We have compartmentalized everything in our body, isolated it in such a way that we deal with that one particular symptom only. But we don't look on reverberations for the rest of the organism, rest of the body. Sometimes, you know, the price for curing one thing is very high. It might be deadly because you destroy the other body. That's why we have this crazy time when you read a, a medicine, you read a drug, and the side effects of that drug are much greater than the effectiveness of that drug on um, that what you want to use it for. I look on a body, I used to deal with engines a lot, you know, and especially sort of engines which had lots of pressures inside, you know, high pressure steam engines, you know, and in order for that thing to work perfectly, you have to have a lot of fuses. You have to have all kind of warning signals. If you have an overpressure, too much fuel, too little fuel, um, it starts too soon to inject fuel, or too late, you know. And this was all done by various signals. You know, if start anything went out of whack, you know, you get a red light, you know, and then the horn would sound, you know, to remind you that something is wrong with that machine. And you could turn it off before things get worse, so you have to sort of fix it quickly. Well, as time went, you learn that sometimes some of the things which went on and were very superficial, and that you can run that engine even if you disconnected certain things, bypass certain functions, you can still run it. So what you do, you cut 
the whole connection, you neutralize the light. And so machine would be running and these problems would not anymore show. And so you think you fix the problem. But things get worse because of it. And then more serious problems start to pop up. Until eventually you get a bang and that be it. You know, engine blow up into pieces. And this is with our bodies. It's very similar. We have all kind of bell and whistles to let us know that something is wrong. To let us know that certain pains, temperatures, uneasiness, whatever, is an indication something is wrong. So you go to a doctor and he gives you a, a pill or something which bypasses that warning signal, you know. You have no more headache. But body is still malfunctioning. And now warning signal is gone so you can have a deeper problem. And so when this pop up, you might have no more headache, but you might have aneurysm or you might have very serious debilitating illness. And so, you know, our health tends to go with times, you know. If there is too much stupidity around, we soak that stupidity in, and that means different opinions, crisscrossing, you know, and we don't know what to do, so we follow the thing, that thing for a while, and eventually our system is so out of whack that we just give up and say, oh, well. And, you know, that's because body itself is just a machine. But we have within us, as I said, mind. You know, Now, mind is not a brain. Actually, I would say, based on uh, information's in existence, mind is a spiritual substance, which itself is not a personality. It's like a blackboard. You can write on it, and you can read from it what is written on it. So, because it's a spiritual substance, you can wipe it out, what you have written on it, and you can write something else on it. That means you can imprint certain thoughts, certain belief, and when this is imprinted, then the body can pick it up and try to modify itself to that what is on that mind. It's like a sort of a schematics, perhaps, or a, an instruction, which comes from the spirit, because spirit itself doesn't have a body, but it's a creator of it, and is using the mind to basically adjust the reality perceived through the body to reflect that in a body. Uh, you see, if there was a, you cannot have it two ways. You cannot have a sort of a spirit <coughs> which is um, thinking, intelligent entity competing with the body which is thinking intelligent entity. You cannot have two sort of thoughts, contradictory. Body has to listen, but it's on a chain, you know. Body get a message through the mind. But because we do not somehow <clears throat> understand our inner self, we speak about mind as ours, meaning we see ourselves as a body. I change my mind, uh, I'm brainwashed, I brainwash my mind, you know, using all kind of terms which clearly indicate that it is not a personality we're speaking of, which is within us. It is something which belongs to us. But in some ways, you know, we don't realize that uh, when we're saying that, it is the spirit which controls the mind, not the body. Body just reads from it and then adjusts itself into it. So it's the belief which is part of the mind. I make my mind about it, I believe that. Belief is not something which body conceives. Matter doesn't conceive belief. That cup doesn't have a belief, you know, but it can act as it have a belief if you have programmed it a certain way, you know. Uh, body basically responds. So if I have a belief that I'm ill, I feel that belief through my whole body that illness manifests because of that belief. So if I have a right beliefs, then my body would be in much better shape than if I have a wrong beliefs, because we tend to create our belief. The purpose of a consciousness, which is a sort of a spirit control, is to manifest itself. Anything which occurs to me, I want to experience it. 
I want to be it. And by doing so, I'm creating that reality. So we are manufacturing our health. And we, we are truly manufacturing our illness. There was this guy many years ago in Portland, Maine. It was in 1860s. His name was Grinsby. He was a natural healer who have studied this relationship between the spirit and body. And he came to the conclusion that every illness, except really physical injuries of some kind, is brought about by the wrong opinion, by a belief which is contrary to the truth, truth as to what we are and how we create ourselves. And what he would do, he would talk to these patients who come to him. And he got about 15,000 people in seven years period, you know, who came to his office. And he treated virtually all of them. Doesn't matter what was wrong with them, whether it was a polio, whether it was a cancer, whether it was blindness, people were dying. They would come to him and he would treat them just talking to them. There was never any discussion of any medicine. There was never any discussion of any any recommendations for this or that. He just would sit next to the person and after a while he would pick up a vibration of that person. And the illness and sort of feelings of that person would come to him and he would feel them and he would experience that pain. And he would know that the same pain he experienced as the patient has is product of his mind. But it's not real pain. And he would show it as an example to the patient, explain him the cause of his illness because he could feel the causes rather than the phenomena, and he would cure. And the person realized it was caused by his belief. Immediately, pretty well, the illness would disappear. And he done that, and I studied him very carefully because to me, he, this was the, he was the greatest psychologist, and uh, he understood. It's only recently we have research which shows that um, in a process of living, we are producing a field, very low frequency electromagnetic fields around our body. And these fields tend to cross from one body into the other body over the distance. In a human beings, it can be as far as 15 feet. But he, there were experiments done showing that heart itself, you know, is really much more than just the pump which beats. The heart is actually the most sophisticated part of our brain. And that it has a tremendous effect on the way we behave, we think, and the way we are as far as intelligence is concerned. And he was able to experimentally show, for example, taking a heart from one frog, you know, and putting it, it next to the heart of the other frog into a, a, a dish that uh, the living heart would restart pretty well the heart of the frog, which was already not beating, and that they would synchronize in a beat. And he was able to show that this can happen on, over a certain distance, about six centimeters. But when you put a sort of a <coughs> piece of crystal between, it would, it would stop. So he was arguing there is some sort of electromagnetic frequency which is transmitted in a bit from one organism into the other. And it would try to send a message and to make correction of any malfunction. And so being in unison sometimes mean, I thought of it a lot, I said, well, if this is true, that sometimes our behaviors really depend very much who we are with, not because we share their views and uh, attitudes, but because we share the same heartbeats. And so if you are, let's say, in a crowd, which goes suddenly bananas, you know, and even the sane and decent people are carried by it, it's not because they got soft in their brains or something, but because the heartbeat of the crowd is now beating as one. And the lowest emotions usually are the strongest one. 
and they just take over. And as I said, brain was shown to be extension, heart was shown to be extension of the brain, so people go and behave that way. That's why, for example, mother, when she has a child and holds the child, it's not the sound of the heart, which has this calming effect, but it's the energy which radiates from the heart. It's a spiritual rather than physical component, holographic in a sense. And this synchronizes the beat of the mother with the beat of the child. And if the mother is calm and wise and protective and confident, child knows it through this heartbeat. If we are disturbed, if we are full of restlessness, if, we, if our heart is beating uh, too fast, then obviously this effect would also affect those who are nearest to us. So we are never isolated. We live in a world where we mingle, and we mingle sort of in an invisible way, but we mingle. There is a, a theory that the whole universe is one beating heart, and that uh, there were studies and measurements done on a human heart and show that it's holographic in nature as far as the frequencies which are created by the beating heart. And so when you stay sort of standing, you can build around yourself sort of waves upon waves of these uh, electromagnetic frequencies which radiates in every direction and obviously it would affect anything which is in a, in a vicinity. But since cosmos, since universe has its own frequency, for example, our Earth has a south and uh, a north pole, and uh, there are sort of magnet, electromagnetic, you know, waves, you know, it affects us, we affect everything else, everything is being affected. There is uh, nothing in a universe which in some way is not affected by the field which being sort of done as a holograph three-dimensionally. You can pick up from that field wherever you are pretty well any information. You can basically reconstitute. So our knowledge, our awareness, the so-called Akashic records and all on a spiritual level we might be tapping into it because everything is in some ways vibrating through our universe. And if we are sensitive enough, if we have developed our, as we say, way of listening to this, we would be able to feel it. We would be able to react to it. So mother of heart is not as simple as it looks. We look from a materialistic point of view on a heart purely as a muscle which pumps the blood. But when you look beyond it, you discover that 50% of, of cells in a, in a heart are neural cells, which are the same cells from which brain is made. And the connection between brain and heart through the cells is well established as a direct connection. So when we look on our evolutionary pattern, it is as important to develop our brain, so-called, as, as to develop our heart. That's when this spiritually, spiritual come to it, you know. We have to be in harmony. Our bodies, obviously, are the crudest shell. Then there is something within which we call etheric body, which is a sort of a, a field matrix, which might have a component which we call mind. And through this, you know, our images of ourselves, our, our impressions of what is true or what is error, what is right, are being transferred through mind to the actual physical aspect. So um, when we feel we are ill, at that moment we started, our, we started to manufacture illness. And that illness become more and more self-evident, more we are convinced about that illness. And then obviously we believe in authority. And when the authority tells you that, you know, it, it, it's like a hypnosis. So the worst thing you can do, really, is when you don't feel good, is to go and see a doctor. <clears throat> because you find something wrong with you and tells you about it. And from that moment, you have it. You start acting like you have it. You know, you start taking pills, medicine, treatments, and you just encourage that, you know, and until eventually, you know, doctor is right, and, and he says, yeah, right again, you know. But the point is, uh, if you don't, I was just reading a book today, which I've got, and they clearly show, for example, on cancer, in statistics that people who are not treated live four times as long than people who are being treated, you know. 
And I was quite amazed. It was a British study, and it was a huge study, and there's a lot of things, but I would believe that's why I've never been to a, to a doctor. You know, honestly and truly, I've never been to a doctor. Maybe as a boy, baby, you know, but I'm in Canada 35 years, for example, and I've never been to a physician for any illness, never took one prescription pill or anything. Not that I wasn't sort of loving healthy all the time, so I felt really bad, but I don't want to know what's wrong with me because I don't want to create that kernel, that beginning of the illness. I just let it go, say, body knows best, you know. It would clear it, you know. Let it go, you know, and it goes, you know. If you go to a doctor, he stops you in your tracks. He says, hey, listen, what's wrong with you? Test, upon test, and he just hammers you down more and more until you, you are defeated and say, hey, doctor, do something. And that's when it all starts, you know. It's a big business medicine, you know, and it's vested interest to anybody who is practicing it, to get as many ill people as possible. It guarantees income and it guarantees huge profits. I was just looking today, 28, million dollar, 28 billions a year is spent every year in drugs which are used for treatment of cancer alone. I mean, who wants to be healthy, you know? I mean, you discover some herb or simple remedy and you know, you wipe out 28 billion those, well, it doesn't work well. So that's what I'm saying. Everything is a big lie. We have to be always aware that somebody wants to profit from our illness as well as from everything else. But there is always somebody waiting to sway you in the direction which is profitable. Nobody will try to deal with you in order that he lose and you gain. It's usually opposite, you know, you you pay sometimes much more than you you gain. So when I'm saying, you know, be aware that uh, we live in a world of big lies, everything seems to be is big lie. I looked into all kind of directions in science, whether it's sort of biology, zoology, physiology, whatever, physics, you would discover that you have a main stream uh, supporters, and then you get people who are on fringes, these so-called unorthodox people, you know, alternative. And these people have totally different views. So obviously you cannot have a situation where you have entirely two different view and both claiming to be right. You have a situation very likely where Nobody's probably right, you know, but some side has more power to assert itself. So you have to look always for yourself. Do not listen, because today they would say, drink that coffee, it's good for you. And then a few years later it says, sorry, don't drink that coffee, it's bad for you. Eat that butter, it's good for you. Don't touch that butter, margarine is good for you. Everything, you know as you go through life that if you follow everything what I tell you, you'll be crazy. You know, you will absolutely be dead very likely because there are very serious issues. For example, we hear all that 50% and more of population is overweight, you know. And now they're looking for explanations, so they're trying to blame it on carbohydrates, you know. It was always carbohydrates are good for you. The bad for you, it's the, uh, sorry, good for you, it's the proteins which are bad for you. Don't touch that meat, don't touch this. Now they're coming to a conclusion that perhaps, you know, they overshoot it and that maybe too much pasta is far worse for you than too much chicken or steak or something. But anyway, so all what I'm saying is that uh, nothing is sure. We live in a world where things are very relative and you have to sense your body and you can sense your body when you do not listen to all these inputs from everywhere, you know, because everybody has his vested interest. And today, science, for most part, is just a, a junk science. Big money in it, high stakes. So you have to be always mindful of it. As they say, buyer will be aware. And so you have to be always, and uh, you know, when your body is not doing well, then don't, you don't feel good. Even if you have not specific illness, so to speak, you don't feel you are healthy. You know there's something wrong with you somehow, and by that awareness, it's become predominant. It, it sort of sits in front of you all the time. You feel your body. So you cannot be free in a spirit. 
nor you can be free in the mind. You cannot think very clearly if you have a headache, for example. You, know, you might not know what's caused the headache, but that headache would dominate your thoughts. You would be just unable to concentrate, to read. You'd be not able to smile. You'd be irritated. And obviously, your spiritual aspect will be completely gone. That's the least one anybody's concerned when you have a headache, you know. You try to cure that headache. So we have to be careful what we put into our bodies, because obviously whatever we put our bodies, in a way, has some effect. Otherwise, if there was no effect, it would, it would kill us, because there'd be no exchange of energy, we would have no no nutrients, anything. And one, when you start extracting something from the body, there is an effect. So I would say that anything we eat is a medicine. By any definition, if medicine can, it's purely a difference in dosage, you know. And so, um, obviously, what we eat is very important. And more we feel heavy after we eat, more energy it takes for us to to digest, uh, more likely we have more pollution and strain on every every sort of vein and every artery and every cell and so eventually something goes wrong. So we have to, in order to be healthy, we have to first understand what we're eating. And more we eat, probably less it is good for us. We have to eat in moderation, not to be hungry, but not to suffer with overeat. It's a sort of a, a story which goes over and over. You listen to these people who lived 100 years and more. One of the things they have in common is that they never over it. They sort of tend to leave the food, as we say, partially uneaten, right? You know, not to get a second, third helping. So you have to be careful. And study on animals shows that lower calorie intake increase, increase the longevity. So that's one thing. There was this guy from Italy. Uh, his name was Count uh, Carnito, Carnato, and he wrote his book about long life when he was 100. You know, and he explained, and one of the things he stressed, you know, eat in moderation, you know. But he was not sort of nutritionist telling you this is good for you. Eat in moderation. Eat what you like, because when you eat what you like, it's good for you. And if you don't like what you eat, it's bad for you. This is so-called instinct eating, you know. There is a the whole movement in France, and it's spreading to North America, which is called instinct eating. That means that um, the guy argues, is where the, when animal eats, what makes him to stop eating? What it is which makes him to suddenly stop eating? Why he doesn't eat and eat until he bursts? What is the mechanism that doesn't matter how good it might be in some way he stops eating? And they look back into all kind of historical precedents in humans when they've been hunters and whatever. And it came to the conclusion that we have a cells in our body which are not the so-called pure taste cells, but they are cells which determine how much food we can actually eat. So as we eat something and it's good and tastes good, that means we are still ready for it. But when suddenly the things get, for example, sour or bitter in our taste, even if it tasted sweet before, that means that they, they say this, the same cells activated the process because they analyzed that anything over would be dangerous to our body. So that how we sort of stop eating, that taste start to change. And it st start to change when, if it is not good for us. So when we feel ill or something is wrong, we might not even eat that thing. That's why when we are ill sometimes, we refuse to eat certain things, which might be very good to eat when we are healthy. We have to eat, but in an illness, we don't want it. We have enhanced the sensitivity and body instinctively know. That's why animals, when they suddenly are ill, they have no school in pharmacology or something. They go and eat suddenly something. Somehow they eat it and they cure themselves because it tastes to them differently. You know, body needs it. So there is attractiveness between the taste of it and 
<laughs> and, uh, and a need for it. So in some ways, you know, the food, which one of the best tastes of uh, the, the, the selection of whether it's good for you or not, is to taste it. If it doesn't taste good for you, in some ways, you know, might not be good for you, you know. And so we have overridden this instinct by grazing and overeating and by eating various artificial flavors which were created, we have destroyed this instinct. So we now don't have it as a rule in us, and we eat anything, and we would over it very easily because we don't have this mechanism which change the taste of what we're eating, you know. But these guys win themselves out of it, you know, and experimentally try to uh, eat according to their instinct, and they discover it, it's a marvelous thing, you know, they all improve their health, they lose their weight, overweight, everything, you know. So there's a harmony. Body knows always, but we try to override that body always with a limited knowledge we have. So we think, you know, this is good and this is bad, but we should decide it ourselves by trying to live pure life. So that's for a body, you know. You need some assistance to the body in order to cure it. Obviously, it's good to educate oneself and go to a most traditional natural type of healing, which have historically proved itself to be effective, and it's been around, so it's time tested. So, like for example, use of herbs and simple remedies, drinking water, whatever, is much more powerful than something very new which we have created in this century only. There is no track record. We do not know truly a side effect of many of these things until maybe the new generations, and then might be too late, you know, so. Uh, we should always listen our bodies. And we can listen more and more if we know how to listen. You see, we have too much activities, too much noise going around us, which prevent us from actually getting a chance. So when we talk about our bodies, we feel there is an intelligence which knows what to do in order to keep the body going in an optimum condition given the circumstances. You might have certain setbacks and you have to account for them. It might be an age, it might be a pollution in the air, it might be a toxicity in general around you, and obviously this is becoming very, very critical. So the body might not necessarily be as good as it used to be when we were very young because we had obviously much better function of all things, fresh and new, or people who lived centuries back. It's like uh, many people say that tomato doesn't have any taste, the fruit doesn't taste anymore, the vegetables don't taste as they used to. Well, this is true, then they taste, but we ourselves don't feel as we used to. You know, it's, everything is sort of interconnected, you know, we're getting too much uh, wrong stuff to us, is around us, and then that big lie I was telling you, that mental pollution, the lo uh, wrong informations, you know, vested interest trying to sway you to do certain things which are not good for you. So we suffer. And then obviously our spiritual side is virtually neglected. How many people really consider that of any essence, any consequence? Very, very few. And at the same time, this is probably the most important part of us. It's definitely the most important part of for me, but it's the most important part for all of us. But we don't want to know it. We don't want to bother with it, and eventually we have to deal with it sooner or later, but that might be already too late. So your mind, people say, well, okay, how to keep that mind not uh, running, you know, how to keep that mind under control, how to, how to achieve things, how to, to live a better life, you know. And uh, people don't say about how to be more spiritual and as a result of it things will get. No, we look on a mind. Well, we try all kinds of things, you know. First, we try to study and that way we want to increase our knowledge about the world around us and about us uh, in hope that somehow that would help us to be in better control, to be more visits, etc., etc. 
but this is all very superficial. This is all very, very superficial, and it would collapse on a first occasion. When something goes wrong with you, all your convictions, all your uh, whatever, determinations to be whatever you want to be, go sideways. How many people know they failed in a critical moment? They knew better, but they, they couldn't do better, you know. The mind is a really sort of just a, a thing which uh, gives us very superficial uh, way of seeing the reality and never seeing us as a spiritual people. Now, I have no problem with uh, sort of issue of a mind as far as having control over it. So the mind do what I tell mind to do, rather than mind will do whatever it wants, and then I have to just blindly follow. So people say, well, spirit is strong and flesh is weak, saying, you know, well, I meant well, but unfortunately I had to end up drink or whatever, that other things. You know, mind is something which we have to be mindful, that it can do lots of good to us, and open the doors to a spiritual reality we don't even have a glimpse of now, or it can do lots of harm to us by shutting us from all these realities. It's not the body which would be aware of it, but through the body and through the way the body feels, the mind tends to reflect and behave, and it's a, it's a feedback, you know. Sometimes your mind causes your body to be in disarray. Sometimes your body causes your mind to be in this array, but sort of, we don't feel our spirits, you know, in that way, because it's sort of much deeper. Now, people try all kinds of techniques to, to develop their mind, to steady the mind, to improve the mind, and that means everything what people mean by mind, the memory, the intellect, uh, personality, willpower, whatever, I, I put it all under this so-called term mind, which is sort of obviously happening because of a brain. So, anyway, there is a guy, his name is Eknad Eshwaran. He's a fellow from India, but he's been living in Berkeley, California for many, many years, for at least 40 years, if not more. And he's founder of Blue Mountain Meditation Center. And they do publish all kinds of books. And they are all extremely spiritual books, you know. And um, he wrote himself maybe 20 books or so. And if I look on a Western mind and an Eastern spirituality, I would say that that's the best blend. You know, you would really understand depths of uh, some of these cultures which are surrounded in a spiritual milieu of, let's say, Hinduism, and the effect of that culture on the mind, and how the Eastern mind see the Western mind. And it's a very, very good stuff. The guy also wrote a fantastic book on meditation, how to meditate, and how to sort of um, change because of that meditation, because there's all kind of books on meditation. God, everybody tries to meditate, but I'm sure that most of us probably don't have a foggiest idea what really meditation is. We feel it's a state of relaxation, just some people say, well, Meditation is first cousin to dozy, you know, so people go to meditate and still. But this guy put it very nicely, you know, and I thought that um, I might read you a few little things from this meditation section here, which is very brief, so you understand how we can meditate and what it would do to us, not only on physical body, but on our mind, and how we through it reach the spiritual. Because we're talking in a harmony. If the shoe doesn't fit, you feel that fit. And if something is wrong with you at any level, whether it's mental, spiritual, physical, you would feel it. And it would disturb you and it would stop you from being free and truly, fully evolving as a spiritual being. Because that's what you want to do. Because you are what you are. When I said you have a belief, that belief is not change when you go and you lose your body. You created that body with your belief. When you sleep and you have a dream, in that dream you have a body. That body can be young, could be old, could be healthy or could be ill. In your dream you create your health or your illness. You create everything. But 
you believe it's reality, it's a dream, but it is reality for a spirit. Nothing changed now. You have your dream in a body. It's a daydreaming. We are dreaming all the time, except when we are consciously aware of something. We don't call it dream. But when I dream, how do I know I'm not consciously aware of it? I think it's reality. It's a very thin line which divides us from what is real and what is dream. So I'm trying to say that we, in our spirit, create our our world, and this world reflects back to the spirit. So there's a loop. But this guy said a number of things about meditations. And I've been asked by some people, say something about meditation. How to properly meditate, you know? I feel that most of the people have never asked themselves the same question. They just meditate, they close their eyes, and they try to sort of relax and think on one thing if they can, and try to keep that thought. And they're thinking they're doing good. Well, let me tell you, things are not as, as it seems, you know. He says, when I talk about meditation, I'm referring to a specific interior discipline which is found in every major religion, though called by different names. So it is a specific discipline we, we have to have within. And this so-called meditation, he speaks about Christianity, might call contemplation, or spiritual prayer. But it is basically that inner discipline, you know. This interior discipline is not a relaxation technique. So again, here we go against what people think of meditation. It's very real to meditate. It's not a relaxation technique. It requires strenuous effort. It does dissolve tension. But in general, meditation is work. And if you expect to find it easy going, you will be disappointed. You know? So again, you know, this is very different sometimes from what people think by the term meditation. They think meditation is doing nothing. You know, say, so, ah, yeah. that's not so. It's a strenuous work. Meditation, in this sense, is not a disciplined reflection on a spiritual theme. That means, again, lots of people think that if they have some spiritual thing in their mind and they so-called focus their attention, they, they do meditation. But he's saying this is not the case at all. Focus reflection can yield valuable insight. But for the vast majority of us, Reflection is an activity on the surface level of the mind. So again, it's just one more game, one more show, you know. So even if we're focusing single-mindedly on one spiritual thing, all what we're doing is we are reflecting on the surface of our mind, you know, that theme. But we are not really probing deep to ourselves or trying to reach our inner, inner personality. To transform personality, we need to go much, much deeper. We need a way to get eventually into the unconscious itself, where our deepest desire arise and make changes there. So purpose of this meditation is not to reflect on a spiritual theme as much as to go deep and deep into our consciousness, out to our unconsciousness, where we can see our deepest desire, we see ourselves in a true sense, and we make changes the way we like to see ourselves or want to be or remove what we don't like. So if we ask ourselves, what is the meditation? We can say that it is a regular, systematic training of attention to turn inward and dwell continuously on a single focus within consciousness after, until after many, many years of, of the practice, we become so absorbed in the object of our contemplation that while we meditate, we forget ourselves altogether. And we become part of that what we're meditating upon. So we become that what we meditate on. So we would not hear anything going on around that. We'd be totally oblivious to any external input 
which might be going around, whether it's noise or lights or whatever else, you know, you just know the response. Now, what he speaks about is that um, the best way to meditate in that spirit, you know, he says, first, you know, you have to sit, you have to choose the time for meditation, which is very important. You cannot sort of meditate without sort of certain discipline. And I read to you, I have said, it's a spiritual discipline. One thing for discipline is it's, there is certain regularity and there is a certain repetitiveness, which is programmed. So we choose a time for our meditation and we sh choose it in such a way that we have at least half an hour of uninterrupted time for ourselves. And obviously we choose the place which is quiet. Early morning is the best for meditation because we have not yet got involved in the activity of the day, so we are not disturbed by the buzz and hustle and all. We still are a bit dozy from a sleep, and that's the best to start your day. Give it a bit of effort, you know. Now, if you want to meditate more, you might add, let's say, half an hour evening, but uh, don't try to overdo it, you know. Half an hour of regular meditation is incomparably better than one week of intensive retreat, you know, or Saturday and Sunday. You have to do it. It's like exercise, you know. The repetition counts, you know. You run every day 10 miles or 5 miles or 3 miles, and it's better than try to do it in one marathon run, you know. Be better. So anyway, so we do that, you know. Now, if you want to meditate longer, some well, people want, you know, you should have always somebody to meditate with, somebody who is experienced, who is selfless, and he follows the same method of meditation. As I've said, it's beating hearts, how they tend to synchronize. You act as a model, so mother, calm the child, experienced teacher, who is selfless, who meditate the same as you do, radiates through his heart, through his electromagnetic field, sphere of influence. You are drawn into it through your own heart. You both are going down in much better way, you know. So you always have to remember that, you know. The place should be rather cool, you know. So you don't want to have some do meditation in a sauna or something, you know, some hot place, you know. You try to find a place which is relatively cool, which is clean, you know, you don't want to meditate in some dump, you know, you want to have some serene, which reflects, you know, the inner, inner desires, you know. And you should <coughs> meditate in such a way that your, your head is erect, so you don't slouch, you know, your head is erect. And you usually, you can do it either sitting on the floor, but preferably probably to sit on a stride, back chair, you know, so you can just, it helps you to give you posture. Some people can do it without chair, but all I'm trying to give you a, a basic practical aspect of meditation, knowing the purpose of meditation, and that is not to sort of contemplate some spiritual thing, but rather to go deeper into yourself and see yourself in your true shape, you know, true essence. Then you close your eyes when you're sitting properly with back your high erect, you know, in a chair, you close your eyes, and in your mind, so use the word of a very simple, positive, inspirational passage. Now, this is a big issue. What is positive, inspirational passage? It's not a one single sentence. It's a passage. So usually, you can pick up the one from the world uh, spiritual traditions, depending on a religion or what you like, something which touches you spiritually. And you should try to repeat that as a way of getting yourself deeper and deeper into your subconsciousness. Because I said, you know, we become that what we meditate upon. So you want to become as spiritual as, you know, 
pure as you can. So you pick up a passage which by repetition would bring you to that state where you would resonate that through our whole body and mind and you become part of it. You become that. So you can pick up that from the Bible, you can pick up that from uh, other sacred literature. But I would recommend that uh, you don't pick up something which is uh, secular or something which is new because the longevity of that uh, passage you would choose which was proven by time and by being repeated by many, many other people before you has an inherent additional strength which you drew from when you meditate. So don't try to be innovative. Don't create yourself your own mantra, so to speak, you know. Try to pick up something which you strongly believe in that is beautiful, that is spiritual. And try to learn that by heart so you can always repeat that in your mind because it's much better to sort of meditate by going through this passage of a spiritual text than focusing on one single spiritual theme, you know. So when you do that, you know, for example, this guy says he used a prayer of St. Francis of Assisi as a constant uh, picture he keeps in his mind when he is in that state of meditation. And he says, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is a hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. You know, and you just carry on. And eventually, you know, his personality changed. You know, he would see joy, you know, instead of sadness. You know, see the light instead of darkness. You have to change. You have to transfer yourself. And this is sort of way you do that, you know. <clears throat> now, as you meditate in this way, you try to add something into it, extend it, so that doesn't become stale. You don't repeat the same. You should keep the same sort of vein, but just add more into it, you know, in a sort of, it doesn't need to be from the same text, as long as sort of it is in the same spirit, you know. So that way, <clears throat> you become more and more embodied in that spiritual essence and become more and more part of it, you know. <coughs> when you meditate, do not look and compare, don't follow any associations or any ideas, or don't allow your mind to reflect on the meaning of the words. If you are giving your full attention to each word, <laughs> the meaning cannot help try to think in, so do not get fooled by it. Don't just carry the words. Don't try to put mind interpretation to it. What the text wants to say by that, you just, just do that. Eliminate any drifting of a mind to interfere with it. But when the distraction comes, do not resist. But give the more words give them more attention to the words in the passage, you know. So just don't listen, just strengthen your intensity on the words you are repeating, you know. Make a movement or noise in that direction. If your mind makes you to stray from that passage entirely, gently bring it back and repeat the passage. And necessarily start from the beginning and carry on. So you see, you try to develop a control over your contemplation by not letting your mind to interfere with it. You're repeating the words in your mind, and if suddenly thoughts appear, you know, you go back what you have missed or start from the beginning until that mind doesn't interfere. So that's how you train yourself, how you develop that internal discipline. Make sure that you meditate every day. Make sure that it doesn't matter how busy is your schedule, whatever interruptions you might have, or whether you are well or whether you are sick, try to make it really a habit, and you would see that 
the miracles will be happening. You just excuse should not be the that should not be a, an issue and they say. Now to practice a medicine um, meditation as such, you cannot practice it in a vacuum, so to speak. You know, you need to have a certain frame of mind because of the meditation. You have to have a certain culture and you have to have a certain audience. And so there are other things which are associated with meditation. You should do in order that our meditation is not in a vacuum that is sort of a branch or it's a trunk with all kind of spiritual branches. One of the things how to keep yourself in the spiritual way is to try focus your mind on something which is to you very dear spiritually. And you do so by a repetition of, let's say, a word or a sentence. Whenever time allows. So if you are in a bus, you have a bit of time, your mind is totally or not thinking anything, you know, you are goofing as we say. You know, if any circumstances you can, you would repeat that to yourself, you know. And in this case he says, you know, depending again on your faith and your belief, but the repetition of, um, for example, holy name would be perfect. You can say, Hail Mary, you know, or Ave Maria. That's good enough. And you repeat it. Or, like he says, he is using Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You know, that's for Catholics. There might be other similar. But you keep that and you repeat in that. This is very similar to, for example, Hindu. For example, Krishna movement, you know, they do have this chanting and people say, why these people chanting Krishna, Krishna, Hara, Krishna, Rama, 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 Hara, Hara, Rama, you know, and these are the different names of a god they believe in, the Vishnu. And once you chant these holy names, you focus your mind on things which are holy, because repeating the name of the, of the, of the god, which has many names, keeps your mind focused on a god. And since we cannot focus on two things at the same time, it keeps you out of the mischief, you know. You cannot think about things which are outside of God, outside of purity. And should you sort of happen to die, you die chanting the holy name, you know, which gets you to heaven straight. That's why they believe it. I remember I told you that story a long time ago that um, there was this thief, you know, who was totally uh, unbeliever in God or he was so beyond redemption, he thought, that there's no point to believe anymore because he goes to hell anyway. But he has these two sons, and one was called Balarama, and, one, and the other was called Rama, or I think so. And they are the different names of God, you know. So every time he called his son, he would actually utter the name of God. But then he was on his deathbed, and he was dying, and sort of all these devils are waiting to snatch his soul. They are just there, and because he was such a sinner, such a bad guy, that they are ready to snatch him. And in the last breath, he wanted to call his son. So he said, Rama, Balarama, and he died. And because he died with the holy name of a God on his lips, these devils couldn't take him, and he went straight into the heavens. So as you can see, you know, chanting or repeating in your mind something of a similar nature has a powerful effect and helps you purity, helps your spirituality, and it's still extension of your meditation. So that's what he do, you know. And this practice is done in many, many religions, you know, repetition of a name, you know, people pray and all, but um, you have to, you have to stick and don't make many changes, you know, you, you just, you pick up your name and go visit, you know. As they said, you know, if you change your names too frequently, then you are like a guy who is digging lots of little holes trying to find the water. You never find, you know, so you have to stick with one name, you know. And you can do that really 
this repetition at any stage, walking, sitting, whatever, going to sleep, when you are hungry, hungry, whatever, you know. As I said again, do not make your own versions. Try to stick with something which is time-tested and proven, and you would definitely benefit in your consciousness, and you would discover that your whole body would feel better. You would sleep better. It would reverberate through all your spiritual, your mental, and, and your physical. The other thing which you have to do is to slow down, because when we are in a hurry, we are experiencing tension, insecurity, we are not as efficient, and we feel we live in a superficial life. So, you know, in order that we do not get caught in this um, hurry, in order that we slow down, we should start our day early. And we, try, we should simplify our life to such a point that we don't try to fill the life with more things that we can comfortably do. When you start to speed up, try to repeat that holy name I told you. That would, that would slow you down. It would remind you. And it works. I had a similar mantra. I think I told you about that ring I used to carry with the inscription, uh, which was based on that Sufi proverb about a king who wanted to have something which when he is happy makes him sad and when he is sad to make him happy. So he called his wise men and told them, deliver something like that to me. So they debated, debated, and eventually they came with a ring which they gave to the king. And there was an inscription, this too will pass. So when he was smiling and he read the inscription, the sadness appeared on his face. And when he was sad and he read the inscription, the smile appeared. And I realized that this is a really powerful tool to control one's emotions. So one doesn't get out of the gold mean, doesn't get too much knocked of the center. And every time I was getting too angry, I looked on it and I realized that this too will pass. And when I was, you know, careless and I was doing fine for me, I remember, and I knew that's to the past, so it keeps you grounded, it helps you. So the holy name would have a similar effect when we are in a hurry, you know. We should always remember that things spiritual are more important than any other things we're doing and hurrying for. I told you, in old Rome, when this victorious general would be going through the city and everybody was hail him, hail the general, hail the Caesar, whatever. He was considered to be a living, a living God because of the victories and power. And in order for him not to get too much that into his head, he would have one slave whose only duty was to be next to him, and as he is being hailed, he would repeat to him, glory is fleeting, glory is fleeting. So he, he remembers, you know. And so when we feel important, when we feel that we have to do it because otherwise everything would collapse and our glory would not be, we have to remember that glory is fleeting and that this too will pass. And we should repeat it by saying to ourselves very quickly, the holy name or other name which grounds you spiritually so you don't ever go of steam, as we say. Now, the other thing, you know, We have to some naturally remember that there is some difference between being lazy and, and slow down, so we don't uh, mix it, you know. We have to always keep the discipline and do things, you know, not to sort of, not to do it, you know. Now, the other thing is, you know, it's one point in this. We live in a society where, where multitasking is a norm. Everybody says, yeah, I can read and eat at the same time and talk to this two ends of my mouth and whatever. Well, that's just fine. But that's what is the worst possible thing you can do for your calmness, for your spiritual, and for your mental and physical well-being. You know, we have to uh, make sure that what we do, we get a maximum out of it. So when we're reading, we should read. And when we're eating, we should eat, you know, so we can really sort of benefit from that 
If we try to do both at the same time, obviously we are not doing good either way. And we might think it's a little thing, but these are very important things. And when you put them all together, you help to unify your consciousness and deepen your concentration. And so you try to be one point thing, because that itself is the essence of having more control over. You can concentrate better on one thing than on two things at the same time, you know? And you have to also understand that everything what you do should be worthy of your full, full attention. You don't want to just uh, be a mechanical sort of... You want to train your mind in such a way that you are capable of concentrating. And this type of concentration on what we're doing, you know, is truly a mark of genius. Because people with that type of quality usually achieve a lot. You cannot simply just do it uh, you know, otherwise, you know. Now, other thing which we have to do as a part of our spiritual meditative technique is to make sure that we train our senses so they don't stray. There's so much temptation in magazines, movies, things happening around, and not everything sort of um, is to our likes or dislikes. So we should train our senses in such a way that they do not focus and are attracted by things we dislike. And then we are more selective and always try to focus in that, on that which is in agreement with us. So we are not, uh, well, I cannot help it and all. We should train our senses to dampen them to that which is not good for us, spiritually and otherwise, you know. And the other thing which is a part of our spiritual purity and quality is the fact that we put others before ourselves. That other people's welfare is truly more of concern to us than our own welfare. And this is very sort of important in a sort of uh, spiritual sense, extremely important to realize, you know, because um, lots of people just think about themselves, about their wants, their ideas, their plans, and in spite of it, you know, thinking, most of these people cannot help themselves being insecure because insecurity comes from this type of selfish, self-centeredness and, 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 and prioritization. But if we learn to put other people first, our family, our friends, our neighbors, we enrich our relationships. Our insecurity would not be an issue we actually would be spiritually doing lots of good. So that's other part of what we should do when we sort of are on a quest of spiritual understanding, spiritual growth, and it's a component of a proper meditation. And then obviously we have to be very careful of what we digest. If we eat a food, then the food itself could be the good for us or could be bad for us. So we have to be mindful that we are not poisoned. We are very selective. And the same is sort of the company we keep and the things we hear. When we read, we should do spiritual readings. You know, we should pick up such a literature which would balance the media which surround us and bombard us with all this stuff we might not necessarily agree or feel polluted by it, you know. And we have this, obviously, divinity spark within us, and we can release that through meditation, through prayer, and through daily practice. And one of the things of daily practice should be good reading, spiritual reading, before we go to bed. Because this is the best time to do it. Because the thoughts we have read before we went to sleep, they would stay with us for a whole night. So we want to put into our mind, our consciousness, something which is beautiful and spiritual. So it can work on us while we sleep, it will stay with us, you know. 
And then other thing is obviously spiritual association, as I have mentioned, you know, you have to select those who have the same goal in life, you know, and you should support them, so you mutually spiritually grow. If you have friends who like to meditate, you know, try to share the meal with them, because it bonds together, you know, and discuss with them the spiritual issues and what you've been reading, so you can bond and grow because strength is in numbers. Again, as I said, the heart beats, beats together. Share with your friends also a time of relaxation and entertainment, because that is as important as other part of spiritual life. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we can do lots of for our bodies, to do right, right for our bodies, we have to educate ourselves as to what is the body and how to keep it healthy, what to eat, you know, how to exercise, and how to sort of um, manufacture health. When we speak about our mind, we can uh, speak about our mind as a sort of um, separate issue and try to keep it alive with intelligence which is in us, try to think thoughts which are self-improving, gather the knowledge and intelligence which is beneficial not only for what you're doing but also for yourself as far as spiritual being. Use meditation to get you deeper through the so-called conscious mind to your deeper subconsciousness so you can see truly yourself. There you find your spirituality. Develop that spirituality through right living, right thinking, right companionship, right spiritual practices. And eventually when it all clicks together, you would feel truly what life is all about. You would feel free in spirit. You would not feel any bothersomeness of your mind, you have no insecurities, you would be in this world naturally, but not out of this world. You would obviously not renounce life, but you would be a spiritual being, because that's what really we are, and we are aware of it now, we are aware of it forever. And we can do so much good by developing these qualities now because it would serve us very well later. But if we neglect that, then we spend too much time on this illusion, on this superficiality, whether through concentration or amusement or entertainment, anything of this world, anything which is smack of physical in it in some way would be left behind. Nothing is important. Look, people have important jobs and they are tired and they are nothing. People are important, they were of Alzheimer, all is gone. Remember things, you know. People get killed and everything comes to nothing. People get lots of things and when they go, they have to leave them all behind. And more you have of this world, the more it holds you like a magnet, like an anchor to this world, and it's very difficult to leave it behind, because you're leaving all that which you think is value. But if you have nothing to leave behind, so to speak, because you understand that life is spiritual and not material, what a big deal. Everybody you know is a spirit, so you're losing nobody. You meet all your nearest and dearest sooner or later. There will be no interruption even in continuation of, of contact. So, <coughs> there is so much going on, and if you respond, if you take it too deeply, it will destroy you. That's why I said believe in a world of big lie. If you believe every lie, you would get contaminated by it. And since truth is not a issue anymore, it's one of the options we can use to win our arguments or whatever we are looking for. We don't become spiritual, we are actually losing that spirituality. More material we are, more less spiritual we would be. 
and we'd be nothing on the other side as we cross the threshold of life if we have invested everything to this world. So all what I'm trying to say is body is important because as long as you have body you are living. When you lose the body you are still living but you have no body. So while you have it, you try to make it as easy. It's like a good car. If you have a car, it's good because you can use it to move from place to place. But better is the car, easier is to move, because you don't think about that car, you're driving and you say, well, I wonder when this sort of blow up or whatever, you know, you just drive and enjoy yourself, because the car is doing what it's supposed to do, you are not even aware of it, but there's something wrong with it. All your attention, all the country beauty and all goes, because you're listening to the knocking engine and whatever, and, and so the same is with the body, you know, you have to make sure that you reach stage that you don't feel you have a body. That's when the shoe fits, you know. So when you reach a stage, then you have to make sure that your mind is clear, you know, that it doesn't create uh, fears and uh, insecurities and bother you with things which detract you from your true spiritual growth. Everything, everything is vexation of the spirits. All these things we do with our mind, we're chasing things, going after. At the end of the day, you always discover that it was not worth the effort very frequently. But you have to grow into it in time. You cannot say when you are young, ah, no way I would change my mind on that. But just give yourself 15, 20 years and you realize how these priorities tend to change concerning the world we live in, and what is important and what is not. So make your mind clear so you can go to bed and sleep because nothing bugs you. You have no anything, no baggage, nothing which irritates you. No fear. You can look into mirror and smile yourself knowing that you are what you are, that you are not pretending to be something what you are not, that you are cheater, whatever, or weakness. You, know, you just are what you are. You're doing your best. You're doing it honestly and squarely. That's fine. You have all your securities, which are spiritual. So you know nothing can harm them. If you have securities in this world, <coughs> oh God, you worry all the time, whether they are physical or, or emotional. You worry about your kids, you know, as long as they're doing okay, you are happy, the moment kids get arrested or something wrong or wife runs away or husband, whatever, security is gone, you know, you shut it, house goes on fire, stock goes down, you know, all through you, you know, because you invested everything around yourself, you know, into the things and you lose control over them and suddenly when that thing sort of doesn't reflect what you expect, you go and visit. Invest everything into spiritual, into your own strength. So you don't get bothered by these things. And you'll be just fine. So anyway, I tried sort of <clears throat> as much as I could to merge the body, mind and spirit to show you that there is interconnectedness. You cannot neglect either one of them or any of them without paying penalty for it. If you have no spiritual aspect, you'll be always insecure. It doesn't matter how successful you are, you are never secure, secure enough in it. You always you have vexation. You always want to move and get more. You know, there's never peace. There's always noise within you. And because of that noise, you cannot see the silence in your heart. You cannot see, feel the spirituality. You can only do it when you develop spiritual discipline which drills you straight to the point, without any diversion, without any noise of external world, whether it's physical or mental or emotional. But you can do it by repetitions, by practice and by consistency. You cannot say, well, okay, I forgot five times this week to meditate. That's two and a half hours. You know, I'll catch it on Sunday. And <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work that way. You have little by little is amazing what you will do. And as you become sort of um, more spiritual, you become more loving in general. You become less moody. You become, as I read that passage there, instead of depression, you would have strength. Instead of darkness, you would see light. Your whole outlook, everything would change when you do certain things. And you start to understand when you're doing it. And you will realize that that's the truth. And when you know the truth, you never want to step out to the falsehood. So once you know the natural laws, once you know the spiritual laws, and one day touched you, and you know that's how it is, you would be obsessed with doing it to the point. We all want to live by the natural divine laws, which are correct. 
And we know it's true. We want to live the truth. It's not that we want to live against. It's only the opinion of falsehood which we tend to play with. But the truth we would never deviate from. And you find the truth in the spiritual. And so anyway, thank you for your attention. Now, if you have any questions, uh, we can do it because we're supposed to be out of here at nine. Yes, Brian. So you're only going to a point in your meditation where you have silence, so you're not hearing or repeating the words anymore? Well, yeah, it can happen, obviously. It's equivalent to, I think, dozy, because, as I said, meditation should be concentration rather than relaxation. So when you have a silence, it's a silence of noise. You hear the silence, you know, but it's not a silence of, uh, of forgetting, you know. It's the purity, uh, uh, crystal clarity of absence of noise, you know, which is different from not hearing. I think we have to... <clears throat> sure, we have to reach the point where we might not necessarily, you don't speak the words, you are mentally going through this process of focusing on that particular spiritual passage, and you're just rolling down and repeating it and rolling down and repeating it, but you try not to have gaps in it, when the mind inserts itself into it, trying to, oh, what a good meaning, or something else, you hear the noise, ah, that was a track, or whatever, and even the silence would, to me, be a gap in that concentration, where you miss that passage. So if suddenly you, it's like a driving, you drive on pilot, no? You drive and suddenly you are somewhere and you don't know how the heck you go there, you know? So you have not really concentrated. You made a trip without being aware, you made a trip. And that's fine, you know, you become part of the, part of the road, or whatever scenery, but the point is that in meditations, you want to be always in control over that, but only that, you know. You can focus on silence as a, one of the exercises. You can try just to see whether you can uh, reach the depth of your subconsciousness or you go as much as you go, go without registering any noise, either from your mind or from your surroundings that itself would be an evidence of a spiritual discipline and a certain achievement, but doesn't have a spiritual component to it, you know. That spiritual component comes from the meaning of that repetitive spiritual passage. If you just concentrate on the silent, you would float in nothingness, but nothing would change in some ways, you know. We're talking uh, meditation not as a object of curiosity, how deep you can go without actually hearing something outside of your sphere of influence. But it's as a mean of changing you as a human being to a spiritual being, to see within you the qualities which you have never been aware of and change the priorities where the internal dictates the external, rather where the external dictates the internal. You know, you see also in the true essence which you really are, while you are still in the body. So my feeling is that when we meditate, we should focus on a purposeful spiritual mantra, we can call it in that way, which is not mindlessly repeated, but which goes and become part of us until eventually we are done what we meditate upon. We have transferred ourselves through that, and we are these people who see goodness in everything, who see the love as a basic component of creation and more, the most powerful solvent of every problem and all kind of stuff. So I would say, yeah, that's nothing wrong with trying to train your mind to be on, under your control that when you say sit, it sits, and when you say turn, it turns, you know, but at the same time, you should do more than just to train your mind to be like that. Anything else? Oh, well, it was lovely to see you here. Thank you very much, and hope uh, we'll see each other again one of these days. Thank you.